Um, welcome to all of our guests, our donors and friends and panelists to this very important conversation around the vital importance of health literacy um, today. I am British Robinson. I'm the president and CEO of the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. And I'm pleased to have our incredible speakers and experts um, to talk with you about this very important um, topic today. Before we get started, um, huge thanks uh, to the Florida Association of Health Plans for sponsoring our discussion today. Uh, Audrey will also be our, our moderator, but this discussion couldn't be more timely uh, given the COVID pandemic um, and ongoing conversations around uh, equity in our country. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to do a bit of framing or level setting, context setting, um, before we jump into this very important topic, and then I'll introduce all of our panelists. Um, so with that, why is health literacy so important to the Barbara Bush Foundation? Literacy is the ability to read, write, and comprehend, and it plays a huge role in health and wellness. Simply put, we believe that literacy is a social determinant of health. And that's why we care about it at the Barbara Bush Foundation. I wanna share a bit of a story with a former colleague and friend and infectious disease expert, um, formerly from the CDC, Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick. She recently wrote in the Atlantic and she told a story about a patient um, regarding their primary care. And I wanna share that with you. She said that this patient only used the emergency room for two years, even though he had a doctor. And she said, as she was having this conversation with him, it was an aha moment for her. And I want to share that aha moment with, with all of you today. Lisa said, quote, we had a conversation about healthcare. And in the end, I said, I would love to follow up and invite you to some of our local events. Will that be okay? Can I text you? The patient said back, well, just call me on the phone. She said, I, he said, I just want to talk to you. And something about that triggered something in her that made her realize that this gentleman had a literacy problem. She said, so do you have trouble reading? And he said, yeah, I always have. I didn't really go to school growing up, you know, and that was for her, that was very humbling. She realized there's so many people falling through the cracks because they can't understand what's going on through their primary care visits. It can be overwhelming if you can't read. And that paperwork and all the, the receipts and the directions, um, it's just simply overwhelming. And we all have to realize that regardless, that's even um, sometimes difficult for all of us that may have college degrees or beyond. So this story reinforces everything we know about literacy's impact on health, both individually and collectively. At the national level, it, the statistics are staggering and they're worth sharing. First, it costs the US, the US health system approximately 50 to $70 billion a year because of lack, because of low literacy. Low literate adults are four times more likely to report low health outcomes, are hospitalized more, and again, use the emergency room just as Dr. Fitzpatrick's patients did. We know now during the COVID pandemic that over 66 million people can't read or understand most health materials that are distributed about COVID. In fact, a recent JAMA article about from about three or four weeks ago, the Journal of American Medical Association, found that nine out of 10 of the lowest literacy states, the folks could not understand or comprehend COVID information because the information was written at a 10th grade level. What are we doing? These are our public health officials. We cannot write information at a 10th grade level and expect people to be able to understand COVID protocols. And so that means that 50%, more than half of all US adults, essentially read below a sixth grade level. Today, we have approximately 130 million Americans who are in this gap who are below a sixth grade level. So if you provide materials at a 10th grade level, they're gonna be struggling. They're not gonna understand COVID protocols. And we won't finally really push through the end of this pandemic, much less get folks vaccinated. And some of these are the folks that are in our poorest, most marginalized um, and disadvantaged communities. A patient's ability to understand healthcare information is literally a matter of life and death. And so it is absolutely essential, which we'll talk about today, 
that patients and their healthcare providers understand one another. We're working, what we wanna focus on today is truly about the provider and the systems. How can we work together to play an increasing role in health literacy, not just for low literate Americans, but for all of us. And that means we're gonna focus on two key themes. That means that not only the literacy community, but the health community needs to focus clearly in two areas. One, we need a plain, we need a, uh, we need resources around plain and accessible language. Two, it is critically important that we link digital literacy along with health literacy. The mm -hmm. connections are inextricably linked. It's not one or the other, but both. So when we talk about accessible language, we mean that our work must begin with plain accessible language. The need for accessible language in our healthcare communications, frankly, in my book, is a great equalizer. We must recognize that even higher educate, educated Americans don't always have strong medical backgrounds and that every patient deserves to receive information about their health in plain, straight language. Second, digital literacy. Healthcare communication has, becoming, has become increasingly digital over the last few years, and we know in particular um, during this COVID pandemic. While most patients have devices, for example, we know that 86% of Medicaid patients own smartphones, but yet there's still a gap because we're not meeting them where they are. In fact, we did a landscape analysis a few weeks ago that, that bear this out. Digital health literacy occurs at the intersection of adult learning, digital literacy, and health literacy. It is essential for tasks like searching online for health information, filling out forms, or scheduling appointments, or engaging in telehealth medicine that we connect these dots. That we not only make sure that patients, but also providers have the digital literacy skills to properly communicate with their patient, regardless of what level that patient may be at. So with that intro, with that framing, with that context, I'm gonna introduce our experts and our panelists, which we're thrilled to have today. First, we welcome Dr. Georges Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin has had a long career in public health, including being the, as the Secretary of Health for the state of Maryland, and he was appointed by President Obama to serve on the National Infrastructure Advisory Council. Since 2002, he has served as the Executive Director of the American Public Health Association, the nation's leading public health organization. Welcome, Dr. Benjamin. Second, Thank you. we have Ambassador Nancy Brinker, the founder of Susan G. Komen for the Cure, the world's largest breast cancer organization. Ambassador Brinker was also former ambassador to the Republic of Hungary, chief of protocol under President George W. Bush, and today is the co-founder of Promise Fund of Florida a nonprofit organization that seeks to reduce and prevent progression of breast and cervical cancer and save lives through early detection. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you very much. And Thank colleague. you. Thank Next, you so Trisha, much. Please. Thank you, Nancy. Next, Trisha Riley Cook. Trisha is the founding partner of BBNR Wellness Consulting, where she works to help businesses and individuals rethink health and wellness. She's also a certified holistic health coach and a certified integrative nutrition expert. Additionally, she's the co-founder of the annual Achieving Optimal Health Conference at Georgetown University and the co-host of the pop popular podcast, Health Gig. Trisha is also, I'm very proud to say, a longstanding board member of the Barbara Bush Foundation, and she spent her life dedicated to literacy for the past 20 years. Her partner in crime and our honorary chair and the daughter of George and Barbara Bush uh, is Doro Bush Cook. Um, Doro is also a founding partner of BBNR Wellness Consulting. Um, she is also the, the Gig Podcast, and she is also a New York Times best-selling author. Thank you, Doro and Trisha, as well for joining us. And lastly, our moderator, Audrey Brown. Again, Audrey is the sponsor of this event. She's the president and CEO of the Florida. Association of Health Plans, a statewide trade association representing commercial Medicaid and Medicare Advantage health insurers. Health insurers. Throughout her career she, in healthcare, she's held leadership positions in both the public and private sector, and she has nearly two decades of experience in the insurance, legislative, and regulatory field. 
Thank you again, Audrey, and to all of you. Um, so with that, let's get after it. We'll kick it off with a question to Audrey, and then she will lead us through the rest of our panel. Audrey, again, we are so grateful for your sponsorship of this webinar, and we look forward uh, to working with you um, in the future, as well as many of your members of the association. So thank you. Um, you know, Audrey, your mission is really to drive better healthcare experiences and outcomes. And there's a lot going on in the in the healthcare space, and insurers really are part of leading the way. Um, many of those issues I raised, you're really on the front lines around that, particularly as we're looking at COVID and getting folks vaccinated. Um, and then this huge issue around the digital divide and telemedicine. Um, can you really give us a sense of kind of what you all are grappling with, where you've seen some struggles, where you've seen some success, and specifically um, where you see uh, literacy is having a, a major challenge um, in the fight for better health outcomes, what you're doing about it, and, and maybe some suggestions for a way forward. Thanks again, Audrey, and welcome. Thank you, British. It's it's an honor to have been asked to, to moderate such a, a wonderful panel of esteemed guests. And I, I will say, um, when, when you and I talked British initially, and we started kind of discussing the importance of literacy in the healthcare space, I, I saw the natural tie that, that this type of discussion needs to occur and we need to talk about how to do better because frankly going back just to the very beginning when we're talking about a patient a, a you know a citizen of Florida just somebody who actually needs to engage in healthcare preventive services there is a whole language a whole language that that people don't even understand or know health insurance basically has its own you know, jargon. People need to know what they're buying. And if they're looking at buying a, a health plan, they're looking at words like deductible and coinsurance and things that they're not familiar with. And I'll go back to just really briefly my background. Um, I did start um, my career um, working for Governor Jeb Bush. And uh, so I, of course, have a, a passion for for literacy and then also went on to, to work for the insurance commissioner after that and really got um, you know, dug into the issues on, on the insurance side, but for the consumer, um, even as as I was a new to the insurance world when I when I joined the insurance commissioner's office, I the first thing I did was go buy a dictionary of insurance terms because it's its own language. How can we expect a person that has no experience in in looking at this, these terms to to understand what it is that they're buying? what benefits are being provided or they're even being offered and what it is they even need. So I think this is a really important piece of, um, of this discussion. Obviously, um, we talk about the grade level or the level up to which we speak or, or print media or put, or put materials out for people to uh, understand what it is that they, um, what, they're, what, they're, what they're buying, what their coverage options are, what their co-payments are, all of those types of things are are things that the health insurers have had to deal with and had to make sure that we look at, we call it a flesh test, F-L-E-S-C-H, flesh test. So we look at the level to which we are providing materials. Um, and that's one of the things that I think is important um, on the insurance side, because if you're buying a commercial product or your employer is offering you employer-sponsored health care or you're um, an individual going to try to purchase um, purchase an exchange plan, um, you're going to need to know certain terms, but we do have the requirement under Florida law to try to, uh, to try not to exceed an eighth grade reading level. But even there, there's, there again, there are terms that people are not gonna know. Um, so there's an, a responsibility on the health insurer through their, their, um, their navigators, their, uh, their agents, um, those, their HR directors, people like that to, to be able to discuss and to educate as to what the terms are in those types of, of, of uh, policies, but we try to not exceed eighth grade reading level there. Now, on the Medicaid managed care side, which I, we do represent all of the Medicaid managed care plans, we try to not exceed a fourth grade reading level. And so we really have to gear um, any types of healthcare materials to, to people's um, level of, of reading, literacy, um, but also there's got to be more education around some of the terms of art that they're going to hear um, when they're purchasing a, a, health, a health plan or if they're picking a health plan to make sure that the coverage that they really need that they're going to actually receive 
and what these things mean. So um, I appreciate again the opportunity to moderate the panel. I don't want to take too much time. I will say um, I will say too though, in terms of the COVID um, pandemic, the messages out in the media they confuse even I mean even myself sometimes. There's conflicting messages, and so really I think having uh, messages come from people who are trusted, like a primary care doctor um, or, or, or a local doctor um, that, that somebody actually gets to go see. I think those conversations uh, are the most important because those are more personal. Um, I know a lot of people love to go to their independent pharmacies and talk to their pharmacists because they can break it down to a level where people understand what it is that they're, um, what they need to receive and, and what what the vaccine may or may not do to them, what the, you know, what's going on with the pandemic and what other things that they might need to do to protect themselves and their family, um, as well as, you know, going forward in terms of preventive care and any other conditions that they have to get to grapple with. So um, we do, and we are grateful to have in the last couple of years, the Florida legislature passed legislation allowing for telehealth services. I think that was incredibly important and, and it was really um, something that over the past year has become even more important. But the great thing about the telehealth services is the ability for a person to view uh, a, a nurse practitioner or a doctor and have a conversation. And, and the conversation has to include terminology that a person can understand as to why or what is going on and they need to be able to understand what treatment is and why they need the treatment and and why they should take that, you know that that advice. So um, I I know I think it's twofold. We we need to as as the health plans make sure that we provide information out there to um, as the the lowest common denominator in terms of level of um, grade level of reading, but also to understand that a lot of these terms are things that. Most most people don't ever have to encounter until they are in that space, and so uh, I certainly appreciate the ability to talk with uh, this this panel because I know each and every one of them have a, a lot to contribute to this discussion, and then maybe paths forward for us to do a better job and and ultimately um, take best the best care we possibly can of, of patients and get them educated as to as to why they need the care and and how to continue to take care of them. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Audrey. Glad to hear that you're looking at between that fourth and eighth grade. That makes us very happy. I know our team that's on this call today is that's music to our ears. Um, and then, you know, second that you're really looking at plain language. So, so thanks for that. So I'll turn it back to you to to keep us moving here. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, I I appreciate it. And Dr. Benjamin, it's it's a pleasure to meet you virtually, and hopefully we'll be able to meet each other in person uh, at some point in the future. Uh, but I did want to take a, a step back. And uh, and really look at from a public health standpoint, what does health literacy mean um, to you, and why is it important for all Americans to be health literate, especially amid COVID pandemic and beyond? And and you know, welcome your your thoughts and, and experience on this issue. Sure. So let, let's talk about understanding that the probably the most important relationship we have in health is that between their patient um, and their provider, whether that's right. a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA. Um, whatever that relationship is very important. Um, and if you really want to get good compliance, that means that the patient has to be part of a discussion. And of course, in order to have a discussion between two people, you have to be able to adequately communicate. Uh, that means you have to both use language that you both understand, um, that you are, are clear about what you're trying to convey, uh, and have some sense of when you, as a, as a practitioner, that you're giving a person a piece of information whether it's oral or written or visual, that, that they really comprehend. Uh, the challenge we have, uh, as you said, that most people, um, at least from a reading perspective, um, we said that it, you know eighth grade level is great, but frankly at 20%, that group of people at the, the fourth or fifth grade level uh, make all the difference in the world because they have also other challenges uh, in, in getting care in the healthcare system. So then you throw in a um, a very complex disease like COVID. So let's think about the words we've been using over the last year and three months. We've talked about PCR tests and antibody tests and antigen tests. We use the word mutants and variants. We've talked about um, viruses 
And by the way, most people, even college graduates, don't really know the difference between a virus and a bacteria. Um, antibiotics versus antiviral agents. And then we throw away the alphabet soup of agencies, CDC, FDA, NIH. <laughs> and the vast majority of the health complex doesn't know the difference between those three agencies and what they do. Uh, and then we actually expect patients to do it. And then today, we are on this major quest. And um, the good news is we've been highly successful in getting over 235 million people having um, their first vaccination. But the average person doesn't have a clue what the word vaccination means. In fact, the word we should be using is their shot. Um, and most of us who give flu um, shots every year uh, talk about uh, the, the flu shot. We, we rarely use the word flu immunization or flu vaccine. Uh, and so I think the, the challenge we've had is that these materials are really written um, theoretically for um, the patients, but they're really written for ourselves. Uh, and we've got to spend the time, effort, and resources to really build the infrastructure so that we're putting things in to communicate people effectively um, uh, in this environment. And let me add one final thing to that, because it even gets more complicated as the science evolves and the message changes. Um, you know, the mass debate is the, the most clear one. And we started talking about M95 masks, and then we rotated to surgical masks, and then we moved to cotton masks when the average person, um, um, you know, used one of those little little um, construction masks that they bought at the, uh, you know, pick, pick, pick a, 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 um, uh, a store that they could get on the shelf. And so we, we've really done a terrible, terrible job of thinking through the messages we wanted people to have. And then we've been thoroughly surprised when they, they didn't understand what we were talking about. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. And I, I like the thought, though, uh, that you said, instead of using words like vaccination, there should be words like shot or things that people can really understand. And I think that the more that we look at the, the term of the terminology that's being used and, and, and frankly, again, on the insurance side, we have our own terminology, but on the medical side, you also have your own terminology and doctors understand what you mean. But it's the patient that actually has to understand why and what they are receiving and the differences between uh, the, the types of tests, et cetera. Um, but that's a lot of discussion and that's a lot of interaction and explanation. Um, wanted to ask too, so we, we're talking a lot about grade level um, uh, readability. Uh, is there is there a sweet spot for, for you as a doctor where you feel that um, that there's, you know, that's Kind of the right level of education and then also i wanted to ask because i know we're seeing it on the the health plan side are there are there ways to speak to people or to communicate with people with, of different um of different backgrounds that are that are better or, or not or, or worse because i think one of the things that we've seen is that they're culturally some some cultures are are more reluctant to engage um, in, in getting health care or, or even to get a, a shot or vaccination. And so what's your experience there and, and, and how do you see that um, evolving? Yeah, you know, the greatest barrier, of course, is language. Um, and our assumption everybody speaks either English or Spanish um, when even within those various languages. Um, even English, um, depending on what part of the country you come from, mm -hmm. um, different words can often mean different things. And of course, with Spanish, they're not just different dialects, but they're just different ways of putting things. And I've seen people translate things from English into Spanish. Um, and when you actually have someone who is a, a native Spanish reader uh, tell you that that really doesn't convey the message that you wanted to convey. So you really have to, to really spend some time and have an expertise in doing that. I think the other thing, of course, is you mentioned culture and having people that are culturally competent that can talk to individuals and and understand um, what they're saying. Because, you know, in any conversation, we often talk over each other. We make assumptions about what the person is really trying to say. And that requires you to actually talk less, listen more, and not make the assumption 
that if if I tell someone, um, uh, as we heard uh, Ms. Robinson say earlier, um, you have to listen to what they're really trying to tell you. If someone says, um, Doc, I want you to talk to me. There's a reason they're saying that, and you have to understand why they're saying that. You have to get behind that. So if someone says, Doc, I can't get to the appointment or I, I didn't get my shot, uh, you, you really have to think about why they didn't get it. And it may be um, something that they couldn't get a ride and maybe they didn't understand it. Um, I can tell you that you know right now we're challenged with a number of people that have not gotten their second vaccination. And I wonder how many of those people did not know they needed to come back. Because I can tell you that when I got vaccinated, um, the process didn't automatically give me an appointment. I had to get another email and schedule it. Mm -hmm. uh, but even I know people who did get an appointment said, well, I've already got my shot. Why do I need to go back? So I think that just, and these are, these are people who probably read it at a grade level much higher than the eighth grade level. So I do think that our communications here has to be not just um, culturally competent, but we have to think about who we're talking to, what their knowledge base is, and what their assumptions are uh, around the process. Thank you very much. Um, I did want to bring us to the American Public Health Association strategic plan does target education, right? So specifically yeah. a high school diploma and income um, and, and income mobility as key factors in public health. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the connection between this economic and educational indicators and health as well? So we're talking culture, we're talking grade level uh, and, and literacy levels. Um, and is there a connection that you see um, from the on an economic side? Well, let me, let me talk first about the health piece of that. So first of all, we know that high school um, graduation correlates very strongly with improved health. So people who don't graduate from high school don't do well from a population basis on the whole society compared to people that do. The other thing we know that, for example, with women, and this has actually been found in almost every society that's looked at it, um, the higher the educational level of the woman, the more likely her child is to survive its first um, year of life. Now, it probably is related to some other uh, societal um, track, and this is just a surrogate for that. Um, but that's a very, very important finding that we have, and it and it stair steps based on the amount of education that that um, that person has, and we also know that wealth is clearly equated with with um, with health. Uh, obviously, the ability to um, you know fundamentally you needed to get into the system card, which we call an insurance card. That's very important. But also, the more money you have, the much more likely you are to be able to navigate around these. The structural barriers that our health system has, um, and that remains a real challenge. Now, you, it still means you shouldn't go to the emergency department for primary care needs. Um, you, you should have a relationship with the provider that have really the best health care. But, but having more money allows you to do a lot more things. Um, it gives you the freedom, for example, depending on the kind of job you have, to um, leave work and go see a see a provider. So we know during COVID, for example, that people did not have pay, that did not have paid sick leave were much less likely to get the care that they needed to get tested for COVID, to get early care for COVID, um, or to get into the system early. Um, and that that remains a big issue. So there's no question that there's a um, economics plays a huge role uh, in health. And and while certainly APHA has been actively supporting a living wage. Uh, for everyone, we've been actively supporting um, getting all our children out of poverty um, because we think these are ways in which we can fundamentally improve health. Uh, and by the way, it's not, you know, race and ethnicity does play a role in that. Um, but if you look at the studies that they did in, done in Britain that looked at issues around class, which also relate to the income, um, you see the same correlation. Interesting. Um, and, and I do want to just mention, Dr. So. One of the things that we're very proud to see, and, and it's just this the session now is is one day away from sine die, right? So we're in the middle of a legislative session. We're almost done, thankfully. Um, but one of the great things, and we're talking about economics and care. One of the great things that this legislature has done um, has, on the Medicaid managed care side, moved for a, a, a 
a pregnant mom, a mother in Medicaid, the current law allows for up to eight weeks of postnatal care and then the care is cut off. They've just passed legislation to extend that postnatal care for Medicaid mothers to a year and fully funded that. And I think that that is an incredible testament to the wisdom of this legislature looking at holistically how economics does play a role. You talk about the first year of a child's life. That's the first year that that mother now is also going to be receiving postnatal care under Medicaid. So she will have care coordinators and she will have access to um, hopefully, you know, more more services than she would have um, prior to this legislation passing. So. I think you're absolutely correct. Economics plays a role, and one of the ways that we can help, um, and the legislature has seen to help, is to move that postnatal care to a full year. And um, I think, hopefully, that that will benefit all um, women as well as their children and families. So, thank you, Doctor, for all that. No question, and kudos to your legislature for doing that. And I hope the nation, um, all the states in the nation, follow that example because there's no doubt that that not only improves the health and well-being of individual patients. Um, women postnatally, but it also um, will we go along with reducing health um, inequities. You know that uh, particularly African American women um, die um, at a much higher rate, um, both um, during during the pregnancy period and, and also afterwards. So this, we know that this kind of care results in improved health outcomes. Yes, thank you so much. Well, and I appreciate it very much, Doctor. And I, I would like to pivot now to um, Ambassador Brinker. I have had the privilege of um, of knowing and working with her for several years now, um, and uh, it's just a real honor to to be able to moderate a panel where you are um, one of the panelists and 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 hear from you. So, um, I will go right into a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, as the founder of Susan G. Komen, you've worked on breast cancer for decades. When you started, breast cancer was an emergent public health crisis, uh, like COVID kind of is today. What were some of the strategies that you used to help women become a little bit more literate about their breast health? Um, well, you know, um, I, uh, I'm sorry, Dad. No, I'm go for it. <laughs> I'm having trouble with my old thing here. Um, I have to agree with everything Dr. Benjamin has said. It, it's um, so much of what what we're speaking about really gets down to trust. Most of the people that we started dealing with when we started Susan Coleman, it was very much what, like the population is today that we're doing with the Promise Fund, the people today we're working with are all subjects of disparity. They, there's a huge 85,000 women in our county, in Palm Beach County, who have absolutely no care and no medical home. So there's a great fear, no matter what language is spoken to them, and it is it is really trust and if the materials that we produce cannot be understood, there's only one thing that does work, and, and that works all the time, and that is to have the 10 community-based, highly sensitive, culturally matched navigators. They bring us the people to screen in the dedicated screening center we've created at the Federally Qualified Healthcare Center. And why we put it there is because they do reach out to populations, and most of you are are familiar with these centers, and we happen to have a couple of really good ones here in Palm Beach County. But at the end of the day, and Dr. Benjamin is right, it is very difficult for people who, who have the great disparities, and in our community, it's a lot of Black women, a lot of Hispanic women, a lot of elderly women. And really, if the language cannot be understood, if we can't find the material sometimes, even our navigators, for them to read, they have to be broken down in symbols, stories, or signs, the three S's. Otherwise, there's no way for people to understand. These, these diseases are very complicated that, that Dr. Benjamin talked about that we're dealing with, and uh, the solution's difficult. So. After we uh, look back, of course, on the breast cancer movement, and we had to change the culture in those days of even using the words of the disease they had, because we couldn't use the word breast on radio, TV, or print in, in the late 70s. It just wasn't allowed. And then how are you going to talk to people? You had to figure out a way to socialize them with them in whatever community they were in by using familiar signs, familiar symbols, familiar people who could talk to them. 
and and be be a friend and a guide uh, before anything happened. Um, and you have to change the culture of fear and abandonment. And that's what most people with disparities today have. They're abandoned. And to create a culture of hope, support, and support for survival. So um, we, of course, created the Race for the Cure in, in the early 80s to deal with breast cancer generally all over the country. And then later on, as we discovered the disparities that were there in our efforts, uh, my my interest grew far more into actually changing that paradigm because so little has been done in the United States. We're about ready to celebrate the 50th year of the war on cancer that President Nixon declared in 1971. And yet we have invested up trillions, the new word, probably trillions of dollars in cancer research. And yet you would be shocked if you saw how little of what we know has been applied to how to make people really better. And mostly it's in this area. It's in being educated, it's being to understanding what they need, their rights at getting what they need, and where and how to get it. And the, the, again, the navigation of it. Um, and a legislative climate, such as we're all trying to change in Florida, to make it easier for people to access care. Our hospitals in Palm Beach County are all for profit. They have absolutely no incentive to do anything for anybody. So we've created our own care system. You know, we have, um, we with, with the Federally Qualified Center and these wonderful 10 navigators, it is startling how many people we've reached out to, we're able to bring them into the center, get them screened, get them comfortable with their navigator, and then create the continuum of care that they can understand. And your point is so important, uh, doctor, because you can't, tell people what this is you have to be able to show them you have to you have to use pictures make them familiar with the and comfortable in the environment they're in and i can't tell you how worth it has been for us to take the time and energy to bring on the right and correct navigator so we have one navigator who deals with the haitian part of our community we have one navigator who deals with the caribbean black part of the community one who does very well with the elderly jewish holocaust survivors and on and on like that and in a, such a short amount of time, so far we've screened 600 women. We've had 70 bi red zeros and we've had six positive breast cancers. Now it may sound like a small amount to you, but it's growing fast every day now because of this trust that we've been able to establish. And um, the, you know, finally having someone for each patient to talk to and to understand what they're going to do and not just in the long term, but tomorrow or today, and then addressing the social determinants of care. They might have, they might need food when they get home. They might, first of all, they gotta get a ride to get home. They might need food. They might have a very unruly mate living with them who's angry that her time is gone and she's been busy, or a job, a, an employee who's not willing to allow her to go and have the care. So we deal with all those issues by bringing other not small nonprofits into play who do these and coordinate it. And, um, and, and we have to get to a time in our society where we realize that most of the advances we've made in the areas that we have chosen to study or serve have not reached over half of our population. And that is a crime, that is not fair. That's why health equity are the two words today that oh, we who are literate need to understand what that means. It doesn't mean that somebody else has to understand. It means that we have to understand because we can fix it. So literacy in that means also literacy to the intelligent, educated physicians, nurses, hospitals who speak beautifully, but to understand most people don't understand them. So that I have a little different point of view um, about that. And, and I know we can fix it. We just have to know it and believe it. I agree, and I, I think you're making an important points. I think when people think about literacy, you're thinking about reading. Yeah. But what you're really talking about in, in this space, when you're talking about health literacy, it's really the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain yeah. and process and understand basic health information and right. services that are needed, and that, that needs to be articulated and, and spelled out for them in a way that they can understand and at their level. So it's not just 
uh, a reading issue. It is it is truly a, a communication issue, yeah. um, and that's that's what I think I'm hearing from both you and, and the doctor, of course. And, um, and it's, it's both. They both have to work together. You've mm -hmm. got to have people who understand what needs to be read and those who can learn how to to read it or to be educated in in, in some way about it. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned that you have key partners and trusted partners um, to to help with your program and to to ensure success, um, particularly in your underserved areas. And I know Palm Beach County, you've got a lot of great partners. Um, I think one example is Morehouse College, also in Atlanta, right. which has overcome vaccine hesitancy right. in local communities. Um, and they have done so by offering uh, community vaccine events and proactively mm -hmm. working to distribute information about the issue. Um, and as a trusted partner, can you tell us how you and your team uh, at the Promise Fund uh, in Florida are reaching out to people like that it, it, through those types of partnerships and building that trust? I know you talked about your navigators. Are there other are there other yeah. uh, partners that you have that, that have been helpful in getting yes. to that population? Yes, and the, the primary physicians, primary care physicians in our community have been extremely helpful. Uh, the nursing community has been amazing. And when they learn about our program, um, they're amazed because we 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 pretend as if we were blindfolded and our hands tied and how we would feel walking into Dr. Benjamin said at these complicated words about COVID, you know, uh, and all of a sudden then a lot of the progress we had made, people stopped coming for screenings because they couldn't get there. They're, they were afraid nobody had. Fortunately, our navigators reached out to all of the people they're working with, but so many people gave up their screenings and the things they should have done that they knew knew how to do. And I am I fear right now we're entering a period where we're seeing the results of late screenings and just because they couldn't get to the clinic or because the clinic was shut down or the or the source of trust was broken contemporarily. So uh, these are all things that we have to understand these level of sensitivities. And um, we have done a great job in Palm Beach County, I think, in almost every nonprofit we work with has had a COVID program where they're really trying to teach everyone in their circle, even if they're not even dealing with COVID, uh, about the disease and how important it is. Um, but Dr. Benjamin, you were talking, you said something very interesting. When you went to get your vaccine, you didn't even know. I mean, I was, you know what? I was intimidated. I went to a big center that, takes good care of people. And I'm sitting there in line. I don't even understand what they're talking about right away at the, at the variant. I wasn't sure whether it was a variant in the virus or a variant in the actual vaccine. So if I don't understand, how's somebody else going to? And um, I think they did a great job with this, this rolling out of the flu, but they still haven't made it easy enough for people to understand. And one of the best ways to do it that we found really and truly are cartoons using mascots, using things that are comfortable for them to understand and not hand somebody this piece of paper with all that stuff on it that people like Dr. Benjamin and me are sitting there going, I oh, know, let's see, when are they gonna call me or who do I have to call here? Or... So it's up to us to understand the it's a mantle of responsibility um, to whom much is given, much is expected, and this should be expected of all of us, that we make sure that we bring this to the lowest, simplest denominator. Let me tell you a story about a woman who uh, really, really made all of us cry on one day. She worked for one of our top board members in his home, taking care of his very sick wife, and she came to him and she said, Mr. David, I know you're working now in breast cancer. I heard you were helping. I have to tell you something. I've had a lump in my breast for two years and it's getting bigger. And he said, well, why didn't you come and talk to us and tell us, you know, how much we care about you? She said, well, because I don't have any insurance. He said, what? Well, I know I signed your paycheck and I pay all. I was sure you had. She said, no, I don't have any insurance. He said, well, what were you doing to take care of yourself? She said, well, we used an old Haitian formula here. I was putting vinegar on my lump. For two years, she was using vinegar. And it was almost, it was an aha moment. And we all of us started getting tears in our eyes thinking, 
what have we not seen here? What have we missed? And that's what we missed. We forgot to tell everybody. If you have an employee, you've got to make, you have some obligation to make sure they have some access to health care or all access. In our state, we don't have it, but still it's up to us to do it. And that's why I love these federally qualified health care centers. We also don't make people aware enough that at least they can get primary care, vaccinations, early screening, diabetes tests, um, in some cases, all, you know, so our services for all their children, dental work. We don't educate people enough about what we do provide. So that's just, maybe I didn't answer the question, but um, <laughs> I think all of that and trust, this, the instances of trust we've seen are astonishing. Um, you know, once a person is able to have someone to talk to, uh, it, it, it changes their, their world. Absolutely. Thank you, Ambassador. I, I did want to ask the question and really this is going to be for, for you or for, for, for Dr. Benjamin, but um, one of the things that I, I think we've seen through COVID, even though there are telehealth services provided and available, is sort of a reluctance by some people to go back to the brick and mortar to a facility, to a doctor in person. Um, and so are, are you seeing that um, that behavior change and, and is that going to, or is that impacting um, how you are able to treat or or able to make sure that people are, you know, in, in, in Ambassador Brinker's, you know, program, are people reluctant to go and actually get those screenings that are needed for, uh, for breast cancer or for even going to get the COVID shot? They, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Benjamin. You well, I, I think, yes, we do need to work about resocializing people um, to getting back out. We're having that problem. People, people, they've been working, but they don't want to go back in the office. They've been going to the doctor to tell them medicine, but they don't want to go see them, but they need to. You know, um, the, the telemedicine is good. It's great, but it's, it's not the same as a physical exam. No. Uh, ambassador. No, yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I totally agree. And. Luckily, again, I can't stress it enough with the ambassadors, uh, the uh, uh, navigators we have and the physicians, the primary care physicians we have working with them understand this and they see this a lot that people just do not want to, you know, they're slowly getting out of their mask and they're, they're, they're slowly getting used to turning on TV, hearing news about the flu, uh, 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 you know, receding. And then the next day you hear that it was an all time high for some one of the towns that's near us. And that makes people afraid all over again and they don't know what to expect. So we have to be very clear. And I think there is an obligation with primary care physicians who do have regular patients coming into their office to send out a notice and a, and a friendly notice. You know, I've missed you, it's time to come in. I think these are the, the, the vaccines you need to get besides the one you got. Give people a little hope, courage and courage mostly, you know? <laughs> Uh, because people have been deeply uh, fearful of this now. And um, those who've had bad experiences, we may not get some of them back for a long time. I hope that's not true. I hope you're right. And I hope, I think it's on, incumbent upon all of us to try to encourage uh, to our, our, our citizens to get back and get their screenings, get them done on time, go back to um, to what they need to be getting in order to be preventive and to catch things early, whether it's COVID or not whether it's breast cancer or not. There are a lot of things I think that, that need to be reminders to people. Go back and get these screenings and these, these types of things because overall, that's what's going to help them through their whole life. And there needs to be more discussion about, about why that's important. I still think that that's lost on people. Well, there's another <laughs> issue. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask Dr. Benjamin his opinion about this. There's another issue growing today that is, Frightening to me because it shouldn't be, and that's the HPV growth, the huge HPV growth, particularly in in some of the gay communities, but not just that. It's with women and men. It's like cervical cancer spreading very fast. I think there was, a, again, people moving back from getting the HPV vaccine or making sure their children had it. But it seems to be exploding in New York City and a few places that we hear about down here in Florida. And that's really concerning because that's something we really have a great vaccine for. No, absolutely. We 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 had a, a, a growing um, epidemic. In fact, a rapidly growing epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases right before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, and so then COVID hits, and you know, sounds like people were been sexually active, 
they're not getting vaccinated. So now you're seeing the, the vaccine preventable part of that with HPV. And we're seeing, frankly, there's a syphilis epidemic growing in the country, um, which of course is treatable, um, but uh, it is growing. People aren't getting tested either. Um, gonorrhea, um, chlamydia, of course, which, which has already been a tragedian endemic. Uh, so I, we, we've got a lot of work to bring. And if you think about it, we had this enormous, what I call health debt. Right. What happened as people stayed away from medical care for a year. So we're going to see more um, uh, heart attacks. We're going to see more strokes. We're going to see more diabetes out of control. Um, and the vaccinations and shot part of that is just, is just component of that as well. A total agreement. <laughs> well, I would like to um, also I mean, pivot to, to Trisha and Doro. Thank you so much for allowing us to have this discussion for participating today. And as you've heard from, from both the ambassador as well as uh, Dr. Benjamin, um, we've talked about wellness and the challenges for, for individuals to understand why and what it is that they need to, uh, to have a healthier life, live a healthier life. I know that we touched on nutrition and um, as part of that. And so obviously nutrition and wellness are all tied together and, and not exempt from accessible language challenges. Um, and as as our our host British mentioned earlier, the need for accessible health information is the great equalizer. Uh, and we know everyday wellness, which includes nutrition and exercise, managing stress levels, all of those things are inextricably linked with preventing and managing chronic conditions. I know the doctor just mentioned diabetes, and obviously that's a huge problem in America. Um, so you know, from your from your perspective as experts in the in the field as well. Um, is it plain language? How can we do better? Um, it can be a struggle for everyone, regardless of literacy level, I think. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you're seeing and what tools do you use in your work um, as health coaches and, and co-hosts of leading health podcasts to help uh, bridge that gap and, and, and teach people about wellness? Well, Audrey, thank you so much for enabling us to have this discussion today. We so appreciate it. And it's such an honor to be with Ambassador Brinker and um, Dr. Benjamin, and of course British and <laughs> Tricia too. And um, but I just, it's just really exciting for us to be part of this discussion um, that includes health and literacy all at the same time. It's really a dream come true. Most of you know me as the honorary chair of this amazing foundation, and you know. Trisha is a longtime board member, and both of us are mothers too, and health and literacy are foundational, and so we get that. But you may not know um, that we founded a health and wellness company over 20 years ago. So for us, the combination of today's discussion of health and literacy is a little <laughs> bit like Christmas really coming <laughs> a, a little early. We are so excited to be here and be engaging in this conversation. And to answer your question, yes, the need for accessible health information is a great equalizer. We see it every single day as health advocates and coaches. Here's what we know. People want personalized information, not information for the masses. They want to be delivered simple and clear language, as we've heard earlier in our discussion. People are looking for ways to reduce stress. And again, how is that delivered to them and what kind of messages? People want strategies which are scientifically based from trusted sources. We know that health does not happen in the doctor's office or in the hospitals, but in fact, in the grocery stores, in our communities, and in conversations with people we trust. That's not to say we don't go to the hospitals and see our doctors, but the idea is that the community is our trusted sources. So at BBNR, we're part of an amazing community of health warriors that educate people on how to live their best lives, mind and body. And we have a few ways that we do it. Mm -hmm. um, just how people learn to read in different ways, whether it's visually or audibly, people will learn about health in their own way as well, which is why it's so important to provide different platforms when providing information about health. And a few of the ways that we do that at BBNR are we, we convene an annual conference at Georgetown University, and we have one in Florida, where hundreds of health warriors join us each year to engage in dialogue for a day about preventive health and the importance of standing up and helping others meet those, their health potential as well. 
Yeah, and at the conference, people are laughing and crying and making lifelong connections, and it's a joyful learning at atmosphere. So for people who benefit from talking things out in order to clarify their understanding, this conference has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. um, we're now in our 11th year. Last year was our first virtual conference, and this year we're virtual too, but hopefully soon we'll be back in person. Exactly. And it is. It's an incredible way to watch people engage in community wellness, and it's, it's such an honor to be part of that. We have other people in our community, however, that learn best from listening, and that is where our, our podcast has really impacted people's lives. Mm -hmm. Our weekly guests share stories about their own health journeys while inspiring our listeners to hopefully do the same. We also do a lot of one-on-one -on -one with folks in small groups, and this is always very effective. We provide safe spaces for people to ask questions, to gain understanding that might not be available in the doctor's office or where people have to go in and out very quickly. We make sure our collateral is easy to read and easy to use. We work with health coaches and navigators, and we teach them how to meet people just where they are as it relates to their health literacy. And we've heard earlier in the conversation that the importance of relationship health is so important because it's how we connect with each other and particularly how we present ourselves to people that are in need of health care. Absolutely. No, I, I appreciate that. And I love the term health warriors. I'm going to start <laughs> using that. I'm going to start using that for sure. No, I, and I, I appreciate that, that that's part of your your mission is not only to um, to, to reach people uh, physically in their, you know, go to them, Their your podcasts are probably an, another way for people who can have a safe place and something to listen to. And we know that there are people learn better through listening versus, um, versus you know, reading um, materials. But it sounds like you're hitting all of those, uh, those specific issues and coming at it in different ways to really address issues surrounding wellness um, and enhancing literacy. And I think that was the purpose of this entire conversation. I, I so thank uh, British and the Barbara Bush Foundation and, and all of you leaders on, on the board for allowing us to have this type of a conversation about health literacy. I think there's so much more for us to talk about and, and, and more strategies that we could potentially have um, discussions about for, for a very long time. And utilizing each one of you and your, your experience and your, your research, um, I think it'd be an amazing thing to continue forward. So I hope we get to do that. Um, and it's been really an honor to, to be able to moderate this panel. And I know we are hitting one o'clock and I, I know how um, we like to manage time. We start on time, we end on time. I know that <laughs> from our, my, my former boss. Governor Bush. Um, so, British, <laughs> if, if you don't mind, I was going to just um, say thank you again for this this time, and and I hope we get to do more of this together and in the future. And and please, um, you know, feel free to reach out anytime because I'd I'd love to keep these connections going with all of you and do do more, see what we can do for the benefit of the patient. Uh, absolutely, and we look forward to it. And thank you, Audrey, for moderating and. Thanks again to, to all of our incredible um, panelists. I'm sure there's going to be a few questions and some follow up. I know we're at time, but I'm going to do something that uh, take another minute. And if I could just ask Dr. from uh, Dr. Benjamin, uh, Ambassador Brinker and Doro and Tricia, if they have any final remarks and also if you want to learn more about our work, um, please go to our website or email me directly um, at, at Barbara Bush info uh, email box. But Dr. George, you have a just a closing comment or two and then and then we'll close out thank you audrey no no just a shout out to the foundation for your important work and thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this and you know look you're all about health and there's literacy and health um is um, a partnership at the hip thank you thank you ambassador brinker ditto i think <laughs> i think feel exactly the same i think that literacy and and making sure that people understand where they are, what they are in, in time and what they need to do to take care of themselves, as well as what needs to be provided in, in the public sector for people have to go hand in hand and work together. And thank you for this opportunity to discuss that. I think this has been a great forum. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much. And Trisha and Doro, as, as board members and as we try to connect the dots as a foundation um, and really help um, lead and continue to engage on this front, any closing remarks um, 
from, from either of you. Thanks. Well, well, British, as you know, we're just thrilled that the under your leadership that the foundation is now looking at literacy through the lens of health. And, and not only are we excited about that, but we really do think it's our responsibility to do this. Yeah, and um, I would just say, as I mentioned um, earlier, bringing, or as we mentioned earlier, bringing the health um, health into the conversation of literacy is, is basically what uh, um, Tricia and I think about every day. If someone can't read the prescription bottle, if someone doesn't understand a doctor's direction or has no idea what kind of forms they're signing and um, really can't negotiate the complex healthcare systems, which frankly isn't easy for anyone, the end result in many cases can be really very tragic. And it's been reported that on average, well over 7,000 people die a year as a result mm -hmm. of misunderstood prescription labels. So it's time that we brought in our work to include health literacy. Absolutely. Thank you both. And thank you all. This is an incredible panel. I can continue to have this conversation for another hour, but we have to let folks go. But you are now in the Barbara Bush uh, orbit. We're not going to let you out. So we're going to be back in touch and we're going to, I'm going to say, this is not the end, but the beginning. We're going to continue the dialogue. Thank you all so much. We're, we are grateful and we're going to be in touch. Thank you and have Thank a you. wonderful day. Thank you. Stay all. safe, Bye -bye. everybody. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.